All right. So I had all these lovely pictures to show, but um, I think that my computer was having jet lag, <laughs> um, as was my you know, flash drive. So I'm going to talk without the pictures. And so you'll have just the ghostly idea of the kind of thing I might have shown in the background. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, organizers of the Institute of Geographies of Justice, for inviting me. Thank you, all the participants, for a really rich day already. Um, and thank you, all who keep this fort and the women's jail and the other um, uh, ins installations up here going, but going, not doing what they used to do. I also want to thank the Antipode Foundation for supporting this project, and I'm grateful to be a beneficiary of the Foundation's largesse. I used to be a member of the Antipode Editorial Board, and that was an exciting time. I want to point something out, though, and it's a sort of a scold, but it's meant uh, with a big heart. Uh, the first managing editor of Antipode is a great geographer called Bobby Wilson. How many of you have read his work? Shame. <laughs> Bobby Wilson is a black geographer whose first book is a magisterial study called America's Johannesburg. And it's about Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was founded about 16 years before Johannesburg. The stories are remarkably alike. You should all know his work. You should teach his work and Antipode, for Pete's sake, invite him to do these things. <laughs> All right. I'll also add, I've, I've scolded many people around this planet <laughs> for not knowing Bobby's work. He got his PhD at Clark University in Massachusetts, where Antipode was founded and where he was the first managing editor. They've never invited him to give a talk. And they thought that maybe they should give him a prize, and I think the prize would be to take his work seriously. All right. So here we go. So I have a pretty long talk. I'm going to go through it at a ra rather rapid pace. Um, I have a number of topics that I'm going to talk about. And I'm trying to do it in a sort of keywords way, where I'll launch a word or a phrase and then talk about it for a while. And I hope make it go upside down and backwards for you. That is my goal, right? that you don't think you already knew at all. And it's fine if you think I don't know. That's great. We can become ignorant together. All right, the first section is money. The modern prison is a central but by no means singularly defining institution of carceral geographies, signifying regional accumulation strategies and upheavals, immensities and fragmentations that reconstitute in and as another space-time, even if the coordinates, geometrically speaking, seem unchanged to run another round of accumulation. Prison rose in tandem with a world historical transition in the role of money in everyday life. In retrospect, the transformation just looks like a flip. From having been, as for most people, it continues to be, a means conveniently to move stored energy between sellers and buyers of desired objects, money became the desirable end not for hoarders and misers' erotic caresses, but to touch differently and not for too long, to enliven through pressing into imperative motion, irregular yet perpetual cycles of transformation to make money more. Capitalism, never not racial, including in rural England, or anywhere in Europe for that matter, where, as Cedric Robinson teaches us, Class hierarchies among people who might all have become white depended for their structure on group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, exploited by elites as part of all equally exploitable nature as other to justify inequality at the end of the day and the next morning as well. Racial capitalism, a mode of production developed in agriculture, improved by enclosure in the old world, and involuntary labor in the Americas, perfected in slavery's time, motion, field, factory choreography, its space-making imperative forged 
on the anvils of imperial war-making monarchs and their tributary peers who had to ante up taxes in cash, not kind, so the sovereign could arm increasingly centralized and regularized militaries who became less able to pay themselves, as they had in the past, by looting at each battle's end. Not that they stopped looting then or now. Uh oh. <sighs> Nor did the pay packet <coughs> come all at once. For example, in the USA, many 19th century citizen soldiers went to their graves still waiting to be paid for having killed or agreed to kill Native Americans or French or their proxies. The compensation they awaited took the form of something that could be transformed to something else. Either title to looted land, an honor for the vast Herrenvolk peerage of enfranchised white men, land, a good that can't be moved though the deed can be pocketed or sold or borrowed against or seized for a lien, in other words, turned into money. And if not a title, a pension, paid out as money regularly to ease golden years. Indeed, Modern prisons were born at the same time as, and grew up with, the United States of America. The penitentiary marked the establishment of state making at the margin of the early republic, whose every founding document recapitulated free and unfree, imported as against immigrated, to make painfully apparent that sweeping ideals of defense and general welfare, long before the 13th Amendment, had no universal remit but rather define in the earliest pages who was in and who was out. Then as now, competing ideologies of freedom shaped planetary movement of people and relationships. Like lives, early prison sentences were short. Those singled out for their crimes were the ones who wouldn't tow the line, excuse me, who wouldn't tow their assigned or assumed line, play their part, hit their mark, in racial capitalism's dramatically scaled cycles of placemaking, including all of chattel slavery, settler colonialism, resource extraction, <coughs> infrastructural coordination, urban industrialization, regional development, and the financialization of everything. Racial capitalism's extensive and intensive animating force, its contradictory consciousness, its means to make things, objects and desires, become money, is people in the prime of life, who might be from five years old to 90, or from 11 to expected, though preventable, death at 24. People who make, move, grow, and care for things and other people. Who then was or is out of place? Unfree people who sol sold things they made or grew on the side, hiding the money in an emancipation pot. People who couldn't say where they work or prove that they're free, or show a ticket or a pass a document to save their skin, or save themselves from the narrative that their skin, stretched in particular ways across muscles and bones, seemed or seems to suggest about their proper or improper place where they shouldn't be caught. The imperative of racial capitalism encourages all kinds of scheming, including hard work by political and economic elites and their comprador cohorts in whatever polity they wield power. They build and dismantle and refigure states, moving capacity into and out of the public realm. And they think very hard about money on the move. In the contemporary period, in which product cycles and profit cycles turn faster and faster, racial capitalism, ever less patient with any friction on money flow, sticking resources in prisons, whence they might not emerge on time and in quality, required isn't all that attractive even though the cages are full of millions of people in the prime of life. We used to think that mass unfreedom, racially organized, must be a recapitulation of, for example, slavery's money-making scheme. But if these massive institutions, weighted like cities, are not factories and service centers or farms, then where's the profit, the surplus money at the end of the day? Today's prisons are extractive. What does that mean? It means prisons enable money to move because of the enforced inactivity of people locked in them. It means people extracted from communities and sent away 
and people returned to communities but not entitled to be of them enable the circulation of money on rapid cycles. What's extracted from the extracted is the resource of life, time. If we use the <laughs> politics of scale to think about this, understanding bodies as places, then criminalization, um, then criminalization, territorially because <coughs> jurisdictionally specific, transforms people to tiny territories, ripe for the extractive activity to unfold, extracting and extracting again and again time from the territories of cells. The time extracted opens a hole in a life, furthering, perhaps to our dis surprise, the annihilation of space by time. The stolen and corrupted social wage flies through the time hole to prison <coughs> service employees' paychecks, to vendors, to utility companies, to contractors, to debt service. It flies and it flies. Indeed, the extractive process begins, brings the mechanics of contemporary imperialism to mind. It's ex extraction in money form from direct producers who can't make ends meet, who take their own lives and their time, and whose communities therefore are destabilized too. But money too gives us some insight into the enormity the enormity of the possible inhabitants and makers of abolition geographies, abolition geography, the antag antagonistic contradiction of carceral geography, forms an interlocking pattern across the terrain of racial capitalism. We can see it. Okay. Section two. Everyone was surprised when the notoriously let the states do as they please Supreme Court of the United States upheld the lower court order that the entirely public California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation reduce the number of people held in then current stock of adult prisons and camps. And you're going to think I'm just repeating what Ruth Hopkins just said in this next session. And it's stunning and it's important in its similarity, I think. Yeah, on May 23, 2011, the Supreme Court affirmed that the Golden State, as California is known, could not build its way out of constitutional violations so severe they could be measured in premature, which is to say preventable death, averaging one per week every week for decades. The decision, although a victory, does not mark a clear turn away from nearly 40 years of life-shortening mass criminalization, even though five of the nine judges recognized the accumulated catastrophe of premature death among the people who most Americans of all races, genders, ages, incomes have been taught to abhor and ignore. <coughs> and yet, approaching year 12 in the global war on terror, we know that challenges to murderous outrage, such as drone strikes, new bases, and so forth, often dissolve into frenzied analytical activity that produces fresh justification negating the prohibitions that arise from courts by the combined force of applied violence and revised legal reasoning. In the wake of scandal and demand for prison reform, the underlying principles and procedures of criminalization remain ruthlessly intact, noisily tweaked at the margin, but hardening, ever hardening at the center where most people in prison languish. <coughs> Average sentences, average conditions, average cages, average charges, average misery. Against the scandal of documented deliberate neglect, in other words, criminalization remains a complicated means and process to achieve a simple thing, to enclose modestly educated people who are in the prime of life in situations in which they are expected to and in many ways compelled to sicken and so die. Many of the processes contributing to mass incarceration, both its development and its epical ordi ordinariness, have been the focus of research, action, advocacy, and other forms of study. Obviously, new conditions are not made out of whole cloth. The present is a constant reworking of, contradi of contradictions, and some of us study history to see how change fails to change, no less than how new institutions and relationships develop, sometimes in surprising ways, from older ones. And we study geography to understand why things happen where they do. In the United States, the multi-decades crisis-riven political economy threw off surpluses that became prison expansion's basic factors, 
land money, people, excuse me, land people, money capital, and state <coughs> capacity. Clearly, the elements making up the prison fix neither automatically nor necessarily combined into extensive carceral geographies. Rather, an enormously complicated people, income, and asset-rich political economy made a relatively sudden turn, which I and others have tried at great length to explain in books and papers, talks and organizing, and repurposed acres, redirected the social wage via public debt, and, re and serially removed thousands and 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 thousands. I can't say thousands enough. There are two and a half million people in prison right this minute in the United States of modestly educated people from households and communities. As you can tell, something changed. Thus, it should be obvious that the fight against prisons requires ambitious political risk taking. Instead of imagining persistent repetition of static relations through a variety of novel or renovated social spatial forms, a habit of thought that tends to normalize the idea that improving these forms is the best that can happen, it might be more powerful to analyze relationship dynamics that extend beyond obvious boundaries and then decide what a form, old or new, is made of and how it might be made into something else. To do this is to wonder about a form's present future shaping purpose, something we can discern from the evidence of its constitutive patterns. Without being beguiled or distracted by social ancestors, we perceive, reasonably or emotionally, but often erroneously, in the form, space, and muscles and joints. And I'll come back to ancestors a little later in this talk. To think this way is to think deductively, there are certainly forms, and inductively, interlocking patterns reveal generalities. I suppose I became a geographer because this kind of back and forth is what we do, trying to see and explain place-making patterns shaped by human environmental relationships, always, always, always elaborated by dependency, the coupling or connection of power with difference, and sometimes but not inevitably interrupted by patterned preventable fatalities. It's in these latter patterns, fatalities, that the fact of human sacrifice as an organizing principle, or perhaps more precisely, the fact of human sacrifice as an unprincipled form of organizing, has focused my mind. In other words, I didn't choose to think this way as against another equally available method. Rather, because of the work I've done with so many people on the ground in many places around this planet, I can't think otherwise because human sacrifice is difficult to look away from once we look right at it. If unfinished liberation is the still to be achieved work of abolition, then at bottom what is to be abolished isn't the past or its present ghost, but rather the processes of hierarchy dispossession and exclusion that congeal in and as group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Thus abolition geography. New thing. Thus, abolition geography. How and to what end people make freedom provisionally, imperatively, imagining and practicing home against the perpetually disintegrating grind of partition and repartition through which capitalism, which is always and everywhere racial capitalism, concocts the means of its own valorization. This impulse and, its, and the methodology adequate to it draw from the black radical traditions, many practitioners, including, for example, the late, great Clyde Woods. Clyde Woods, who knows his work? M better. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. Woods developed a theory he named the Blues Epistemology. The Blues Epistemology is a counter-narrative to dominant development, including to the myriad partitions that make capitalist development uneven by its very nature. In the spirit of the blues epistemology and the black radical tradition, abolition geography is capacious. It isn't only by, for, or about black people. <coughs> Attentive to contingent <coughs> abundance, it doesn't imagine people have nothing. And specific, it can be used as a guide to action for both understanding and rethinking how things could or should happen where they do. Abolition geography takes feeling and agency to be constitutive of no less than constrained by structure. In other words, it's a way of studying and of doing political organizing and of being in the world and of worlding ourselves. 
Abolition geography starts from the homely premise that freedom is a place. Placemaking is normal human activity. We figure out how to combine people and land and other resources with our social capacity to organize ourselves in a variety of ways, whether to stay put or to go wandering. Each of these factors, people, land, other resources, social capacity, comes in a number of types, all of which determine but do not define what can or should be done. Working outward and downward from this basic premise, abolitionist critique concerns itself with the greatest and least detail of these arrangements of people and resources and land over time in order to understand how existing relationships of unfreedom consolidate and stretch in order not only to identify their weaknesses, but more importantly, their inherent contradictions in order to figure out how to negate them. And I suppose the reason we keep coming back to the past as though it were history we could abolish is because so much change in retrospect seems only ever to have been displacement and redistribution of human sacrifice. Worldwide today, wherever inequality is deepest, the use of prison as a catch-all solution to social problems prevails. Nowhere as extensively as in the United States of America, led by California. And if I could show you my next slide, <coughs> it's a, 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 what do you call it, graph of um, <laughs> the G7 and the BRICS. And uh, the United States, of course, is off the charts. There's nobody is even remotely close. Russia's second. South Africa, as you said it earlier, its rank is, is 11th. Yeah. And, the, and the, the pattern for the world is kind of asymptotically chasing its tail, you know, towards zero, but not infinity. So I call the results. So now I change to a, to a new theme. I call the results of neoliberalism's relentlessly restructuring state institutional capacities and the discourses and practices that combine to enliven them, the anti-state state. Mass incarceration might seem other to something thus named, the anti-state state. I think to the contrary, mass incarceration is its bedrock. In other words, the dominant trend that goes hand in hand with mass incarceration is devolution. The offloading to increasingly local state and non-state institutions responsibility for thinning social welfare provision. At the same time, increased centralization, the strong executive, the inflexible laws, belies the delusion of de democracy, the notion that more local is somehow more participatory. Ideologically, which is to say in thought and every culture, the expression and normalization of these twin processes of centralization and devolution patterned as they are by the sensibility of permanent crisis, shape structures of feeling and therefore to a great extent determine the apparent range of socially available options. In other words, the doctrine of devolution results in a constantly fragmenting array of centers of struggle and objects of antagonism for people who seek equal protection to say nothing of equal opportunity. In crisis, in resistance, in opposition, to whom, at whom, against whom does one carry one's petition or raise one's fist? Devolution is partition, sometimes provisional, sometimes more secure. Its normalizing capacities are profound, patter patterning political imagination and thus contouring attacks on the carceral form. As a result, many such attacks exhibit trends which, not surprisingly, coalesce tightly around specific categories, policing, immigration, terrorism, budget activism, injunctions, sexuality, gender, age, premature death, parenthood, privatization, formerly and currently incarcerated people, public sector unions, devalued labor, and relative innocence. Racism both connects and differentiates how these categories cohere in both radical and reformist policy prescriptions. In other words, how people, and here I cite Peter Leinbaugh's exquisite phrase, how people pierce the future for hope. Insofar as policies are a script for the future, they must be sharp, a quality often confused with excessive narrowness. Narrowness being something devolution's inherent patterning encourages to a fault. As A. Sivanandan teaches, while economics determine the politics of race define techniques and understanding, even though racial categories and hierarchies at any moment solid are not set in concrete. So if, as Stuart Hall argued back in the late 1970s, writing I think about South Africa, uh, if race is the modality through which class is lived, then mass incarceration is class war. And yet, 
Breadth carries analytical and organizational challenges as well. It's not news we find answers to the questions we ask. What then might be the most adequate general term or terms that usefully gather together for scrutiny and action such a disparate yet connected range of categories, relationships, and processes as though those conjoined by mass criminalization and incarceration. Seventeen years ago, the abolitionist organization Critical Resistance came into being, taking as its surname beyond the prison industrial complex. So, you know, colon, I think of what's after the colon as a surname, beyond the prison industrial complex. The heuristic purpose of prison industrial complex was to provoke as wide as possible a range of understandings of the social spatial relationships out of which mass incarceration is made by using as a flexible template the US and international military industrial complex, its whole historical geography and political economy and demography and intellectual and technical practitioners, theorists, policy wonks, boosters and profiteers, all who participate in, benefit from, or were passed over or disorganized by the Department of War's transformation, um, transformative restructuring into the Pentagon. In other words, we met prison industrial complex to be as conceptually expansive as we imagined our object an of analysis and struggle to be. But I think in too many cases its effect has been to shrivel, really to atrophy, rather than to spread out imaginative understanding of the system's apparently boundless boundary-making capacity. As a result, researchers spend too much time either proving trivial things or beating back hostile critiques. Can you feel me on this? <laughs> Prove the trivial, beat back the hostile. Rather, and activists devote immense resources to fighting scandals rather than sources. And yet there really is a prison industrial complex. So it has occurred to me as a remedial project to provisionally call the PIC by another name, uh, a phrase I've been using this evening, one I gave to a course I developed in 1999 and taught half a decade at Berkeley, the somewhat more generic carceral geographies. The purpose here is to renovate and make critical what abolition is all about. Indeed, abolition geography is carceral geography's antagonistic contradiction. I'll return to this point at the end, but here, as you who know me will expect, I will remind us that in the archival record of self-organization and world-making activity among the black people of the United States South under Reconstruction after the Civil War at between 1865 and 1872, uh, in the archive, in the archival record of these people, uh, the great communist W.E.B. Du Bois saw places people made, abolition geographies, under a participatory political aegis of what he called abolition democracy. Um, Peren, uh, Tulani Davis, who is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin and also an accomplished novelist, uh, opera librettist, uh, journalist, and so forth, she's really an amazing person, has most recently and exquisitely elaborated this work through tracing its expansion and contraction across space-time in the U.S. South. People who didn't make, people didn't make what they made from nothing, and this is the point of abundance. Destitute though the millions were as a result of the great effort to strike free themselves and build a new social order, they brought things with them, sensibilities, dependencies, talents, indeed a complement of consciousness and capacity, Cedric Robinson has termed an ontological totality to make where they were into places that in most, but not all cases, did not survive the counter-revolution of property. And yet, they left abundant evidence showing how freedom is not simply the absence of enslavement as a legal and property form, but rather the undoing of bondage, abolition, is quite literally to change places, to destroy the geography of slavery by mixing their <coughs> labor with the external world to change the world and thereby themselves as it were, habitation as nature, even if geometrically speaking, they hadn't moved far at all. Such reconstruction placemaking negated the negation constituted as and by bondage, and the reason we don't fully inhabit its direct social spatial lineage is because it was, as I said deliberately and quite methodically, destroyed. Indeed, this year, 2015, is the 100th anniversary of 
a film called Birth of a Nation, which was very warmly received in this part of the world. Um, a, t a tale that made the wages of whiteness not only desirable, but in many senses obligatory. What particularly concerns us here this evening is a general point. To enhance their ability to extract value from labor and land, elites fashion political, economic, and cultural institutions using ideologies and methods acquired locally, nationally, and internationally. And I could talk on and on and on about technology transfer in the late 19th and early 20th century between white supremacists, US engineers, South Africa, and uh, Mandate Palestine. Um, that's what they do. They get methods, use ideologies and methods acquired locally, nationally, and internationally. They build states, tweak them, aggrandize and devolve them, promote and deflate explanatory and justificatory explanations of why things should either be otherwise or why they should stay as they are. But even in the throes of periodic abandonment, elites rely on structures of order and significance that the anarchy of racial capitalism can never guarantee. Now here I would show you a slide of a <laughs> photo. <laughs> Um, that a friend of mine who was on a delegation to Palestine with me during the first intifada in 1990 took in Gaza. And uh, those of you who know about the first intifada know that it was an, actually an amazingly hopeful time, that people were organizing in the occupied territories and in Gaza, and the West Bank, excuse me, and in Gaza, amazingly <coughs> complex and uh, self-sustaining popular committees to deal with sort of every aspect of life at the same time that an, a revolution was going on within, especially a revolution against sexism. There were many, many revolutions going on during that intifada. Um, and I have a picture of three kids in Gaza who, uh, in a crowd, found us particularly curious. And this little boy who, you know, in Shahala, he's not dead, but I can't believe he had much life left for him. Uh, after, uh, given what's happened in more recent years, uh, he's standing looking straight at the camera and he's got on a sweater that says on it, American. It's an amazing thing. Um, but, so to, to ampl amplify from the hopeful part of this story rather than the uh, depressing part, as the actual experience of the Negro during the Civil War and Reconstruction shows, non-elites are never passive pawns. Ordinary people in mutable diversity figure out how to stretch or diminish social and spatial forms to create room for their lives. Signs and traces of abolition geographies abound, even in their fragility. So, for example, the uh, case that I put to you first, during the first intifada in the, in the occupied territories, the popular committees, I mean, they built factories. There were really, there was so much going on as people prepared, prepared, and prepared for liberation, which didn't come. Um, or the Storytelling Organizing Project, which is a project that ranges, uh, travels around the world, interviewing people who mostly, but not exclusively, people who identify as women, whatever they were born, um, who have been victims of domestic violence, who figured out through working with communities and trying different things how to uh, interrupt violence without recourse to police, <coughs> right. without recourse to criminalization. Just because the purpose <laughs> of this project is not to find better punishment, the purpose of the project was to stop the violence. And so the storytelling project, which <coughs> exists on website, people have been interviewed all over, all over the world, um, shares these stories. Or, in the underlying grassroots work of the United Front, and Melanie you know, really popped my balloon the other night when she said, well, there's been a really serious interruption in how that work has progressed, and yet it seems like the underlying work still is abolition geography, I hope, in, in, in progress. Or in the intellectual, political, residential organizing of Lib uh, Lisbon-based crew of descendants of Cabo Verdean migrants to Portugal. So we can find it in different configurations, Abolition geographies made and remade everywhere. All right, the problem of innocence. I've got you all set up. <laughs> <laughs> I noted earlier that many advocates for prison, people in prison and the communities they come from, as Ruth 
so eloquently already pointed out, have taken a perilous route by arguing why certain kinds of people or places should be treated differently. Thus, um, starting from the very, you know, the golden golden, which is the wrongfully convicted, we work down the scale. Thus, the argument goes, prisons are designed for men, therefore bad for women. Prisons are designed for healthy young men, therefore bad for the infirm of all ages and kinds. Prisons are designed for adults and therefore bad for youth. Prisons separate people from their families and therefore bad for mothers who have frontline responsibility for family cohesion and repro reproductive labor. Prisons are based in a two rigid two-gender system and therefore bad, therefore bad for people who are gender nonconforming. Prisons are cages and people who didn't hurt anybody shouldn't be put in cages. Now this does not exhaust the litany of who shouldn't be in prison, but what it does do is two things. First, it establishes as a hard fact against which change might be possible that some people should be in cages. And it does so by distinguishing degrees of innocence such that, such that there are people inevitably who will become permanently not innocent no matter what they do or say, including if they do their time. The structure of feeling that shapes the innocence defense's narrative imperative is not hard to understand. After all, if criminalization is all about identifying the guilty, within the prevailing logic, it would appear the way to undo it must be to discover the wrongly condemned, right? along some uh, continuum. The insistence on finding innocence, innocent TS, innocent people, among the convicted, both projects and derives energy from, the all, from all the various should not be in cages categories, such as those I listed above. A cavalcade of other innocents then emerge in the kind of imagined history that we imagine we could abolish. The descendants of USA racial chattel sla slavery, apartheid, occupation, partition. To achieve significance, the uncritical extension of a partial past to explain a different present demands a sentimental political assertion that depends on the pure victim whose narrative arc, whose structure of feeling is fixed and therefore susceptible to rehabilitation or expungement or at the best plural inclusion into relative innocence in terms that otherwise don't change. I find chilling the idea that some action or activity narrower than being alive is a prerequisite for our care. I think the turn to innocence then might be the desperate <laughs> effort to replenish the void left by various assaults calculated and cynical on universalism on the one hand and rights on the other. If there are no universal rights, then what differentiated category might provide some canopy for the vulnerable? In my view, the proponents of innocence are trying hard to make this shelter. But the shadow line or curtilage, like that legally demarcating people drone murdered or renditioned by the USA, can move, expunging the very innocence earlier achieved through expungement. In other words, the dialectics, uh, ex in other words, excuse me, dialectics requires us to recognize both that the negation of the negation is always abundantly possible and hasn't a fixed direction or secure end, but can change direction and in so doing not so much revive old history so much as calibrate power differentials anew. Consider this. Oh, and I, now here I would show you this really great picture that my partner took uh, yesterday on a walk with uh, Zid of uh, the visible policing office. Some of you perhaps have seen it here in town. Um, a contemporary development in the relative innocence patrol highlighted by the Supreme Court decision but not born of it, is toward the phenomenal spread of both saturation policing, stop at frisk, quality of life, and various types of so-called community or visible policing, and its new formation, which ex e echoes some of the paternalistic side of white supremacist organizations, paramilitary and others. Um, carceral or police humanitarianism, which uh, my pal James Kilgore has written about. Carceral or police humanitarianism is a domestic counterinsurgency program spreading rapidly throughout the United States and abroad. <coughs> I mean, there are people who have these international conferences all the time to talk about it. Uh, police humanitarianism is an addition to already existing carceral geographies. In other words, an aspect not altogether new, but now altogether notable of the general landscape of capture and reward. This too is part of devolution 
and more aggrandizing of police organizations coupled with not-for-profit and parastatal partners to identify the relatively innocent victims of too much policing in prison, sometimes formerly incarcerated people, sometimes their families, sometimes their communities. Such vulnerable people are becoming the targeted beneficiaries of goods and services that in fact everybody needs, every, especially everybody who is poor. But the door opens only by way of collaboration with the very practices that produce carceral geographies, thereby undermining and destroying so many lives across generations in the first place. Police humanitarianism is a dynamic pattern among the patterns shifting and reconsolidating the anti-state state form dispensing to riff on W.E.B. Du Bois the wages of relative innocence to achieve a new round of anti-state state building. I've already suggested, or maybe I've just like hollered, I didn't just suggest, <laughs> <laughs> that what people should have learned during the past 30 years is that innocence is not secure. And while nothing in this life is secure, sitting down to make common cause with the intellectual authors and social agents who unleashed the scourge of neoliberalism, which is to say unleashed, unleashed organized abandonment, highlighting for the present discussion the organized violence on which it depends, onto communities puts into starkest terms the peril of the innocent's defense. So let's think about this problem another way. Um, I understand that recently a, a, a sunken uh, slave ship was discovered off um, the Cape. While all those who benefited from chattel slavery uh, everywhere, and from all the forms of slavery that proceeded and intersected with and since have followed, followed it, commit vicious injustices against individuals and humanity, proving the innocence of those who have been or are enslaved for any purpose ought play no role in the redress of slavery. It doesn't matter if they were innocent. In his controversial but indispensable slavery and social death, Orlando Patterson notes that the power to kill is a precondition for the power to violently dominate, natally alienate, and generally dishonor, which for Patterson are the constitutive features of slavery. It is consi consistent to understand the power to cage as also deriving from the power to kill, not only through carrying out the ritualized punishment of the death penalty, which flourishes in the United States, and by the murderous neglect of organized abandonment, which I've talked to you about and Ruth Hopkins has talked to you about, but also by the ad hoc ritual of serially excused police killings <laughs> that brought Black Lives Matter into movement. And I want to add that the recent slaughter at a church in South Carolina, which I assume you've all heard about pretty much, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, is a case where the young man is not a police, but I cannot believe that one of the, or the series of killings that have been so prominently in the news of the United States of police killing <coughs> black person after black person after black person didn't contribute to his conviction that he should do what he did. Mm -hmm. So as you might know, he wore on his jacket the old South African flag and the Rhodesia flag because he wasn't going to wear a Confederate flag and be so obvious because <laughs> people in the United States don't know other country flags. <laughs> <laughs> Another lecture I could give. <laughs> okay. So Patterson gives us the elegant turn of phrase that helps, sadly, wrap, helps us sadly to wrap our minds around the continuing continuum of killing to keeping. He wrote, one fell because he was the enemy, the other became the enemy because he had fallen. Human sacrifice rather than innocence is the central problem that organizes the carceral geographies of the prison industrial complex. Indeed, for abolition, to insist on innocence is politically to surrender because innocence evades a problem abolition is compelled to confront. Mm -hmm. How to diminish and remedy harm as against find better forms of punishment. To make what I'm discussing here a bit more explicit, I turn to the words of the great arm thief and spy Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. So now I'm getting to the end, and I know it's been a long day for many of you, but we're almost there, okay? Are we good? Yes. Read? Good. Harriet Tubman, I have a great picture of Harriet Tubman <laughs> with a rifle. <laughs> Harriet Tubman wrote, or said, and somebody wrote down for her, I knew of a man who was sent to the state prison for 25 years. All these years he was always thinking of home and counting the time till he should be free. The years roll on. 
The time of his imprisonment is over. The man is free. He leaves the prison gates. He makes his way to his old home, but his old home is not there. The house in which he had dwelt in his childhood had been torn down and a new one had been put in its place. His family were gone. Their very name was forgotten. There was no one to take him by the hand to welcome him back to life. She continues, so it was with me. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. And my home, after all, was down in the old cabin quarter with the old folks and my brothers and sisters. But to the solemn resolution I came, I was free and they should be free also. I would make a home for them. So many of you might know that, that great communist I quoted earlier, Du Bois, interviewed Harriet Tubman late in her life. For a while in the mid 20th century, a small but rather raucous scholarly competition developed to prove how many, which is to say how few, people Tubman helped keeping, keep moving along from slavery to freedom uh, via the Underground Railroad. By contrast, Harvard-trained sociologist Du Bois, a numbers guy if ever there was one, the so-called talented tenth after all was a percentage he reached after counting the educational and other attainments of the Philadelphia Negro. He just counted, you know, he wasn't projecting anything. <laughs> du Bois said hundreds. Then he says thousands. Why? Did he just get sloppy? Or did he begin to see how abolition geographies are made on the ground everywhere along the route, the time route, as well as the space route? Indeed, was he able to redo in Black Reconstruction in America, published in 1935, his earlier research on the Freedmen's Bureau because of the insights truly visionary he gained from talking with the ancient Harriet Tubman? It's here that I think the concept infrastructure of feeling might help us think about how we think about the development and perpetuation of abolition geographies and how such geographies tend toward, if they don't wholly achieve, the negation of the negation of the overlapping and interlocking carceral geographies of which the prison industrial complex is an exemplar but does not exhaust the category. So let me explain infrastructure of feeling, tell one more story, and sit down. <laughs> okay. Infrastructure of feeling. Raymond Williams argued more than 50 years ago that each age has its own structure of feeling, a narrative structure for understanding the dynamic material limits to, for the possibility of change. Paul Gilroy in Black Atlantic and many others have engaged Williams' thought abundantly marking the fact that ages and places have, they must have, multiple structures of feeling which are dialectical rather than mer merely contemporaneous. And indeed, we can know a place such as the Black Atlantic as its structure and find its structure through understanding the place. Williams went on to explain that a tradition, a tradition is an accumulation of structures of feeling that gather not by chance or through a natural process like drifts <coughs> or tides, but rather by way of what Williams calls the selection and reselection of ancestors. In this, Williams disavows the fixity of either culture or biology, discovering in perpetuation how even the least coherent aspects of human consciousness, feelings, have dynamically substantive shape. The black radical tradition is a constantly evolving accumulation of structures of feeling whose individual and collective ac uh, narrative arcs persistently tend toward freedom. It is a way of mindful action that is constantly renewed and refreshed over time, but maintains, maintains, maintains. The great explosions and distortions of modernity put into motion and constant interaction already existing as well as novel understandings of difference, possession, dependence, abundance. As a result, the selection and reselection of ancestors is itself part of the radical process of undoing what Dr. Martin Luther King called the giant triplets of racism, capitalism, and militarism by finding anywhere, if not everywhere, in political practice and analytical habit expressions including opacities of unbounded participatory openness. And in opacities, obviously, I gesture toward Edouard Glissant. So what underlies such accumulation? 
What is the productive capacity, visionary or crisis driven or even exhaustion, pres uh, excuse me, what is the productive capacity of visionary or crisis driven or even exhaustion provoked reselection? I suggest it's something, I've called for many years the infrastructure of feeling, and let me make an aside. Some of you might know the work of Clayton Rosati, who's a geographer. We came up with this term at the same time, and we mean totally different things. And we've agreed to continue in our separate paths. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've read Clayton, take Clayton seriously in his terms. This is different. Okay, in the material world, infrastructure underlies productivity. It speeds some processes up and slows down others, setting agendas, producing isolation, enabling cooperation. The infrastructure of feeling, while truth be told, material too, in the sense that ideology becomes material as do the actions that feelings enable or constrain, the infrastructure of feeling underlies our capacity to select, to recognize viscerally one possibility against another, choosing and accumulating liberatory lineages in a lifetime, as Du Bois or Harriet Tubman exemplify, as well as between and across generations and places. What matters, which is to say what materializes, are lively articulations and surprising emergences and syncretisms. If then, the structure of feeling for the black structures of feeling for the black radical tradition are age upon age, shaped by, as I think I already said, an energetic expectation for and direction toward unboundedness, then the tradition is inexactly, however much a changing same, movement away from partition away from exclusion, indeed, it's inverse. In other words, the black radical tradition's geographic expression, abolition geography in short, requires challenging a presumption that has been central to forming the political spaces um, of the 20th century, especially the nation state. And that is the coupling of territory and liberation as simultaneously alienable and exclusive. That's a problem. We can make homes for all, and by that we don't just mean housing and addresses, but that is a good start. <laughs> Rather, by seizing the particular capacities we have and repeating ourselves, trying, as C.L.R. James wrote about the run-up to revolutions, trying every little thing, going and going again, we will, because we do, change ourselves in the external world, even under extreme constraint. So here's my last story. For a last story, let's take a place that is no place. And I have a really <coughs> great picture. <laughs> it looks like it. Pelican Bay State Prison. Uh, and we started the evening with a discussion of torture. I'm going to end with that as well. Uh, Pelican Bay State Prison is a maximum, maximum security prison in the northwest corner of the state of California. Uh, the maximum security, uh, this kind of housing, security housing unit, was developed in the former West Germany, where in the absence of a death penalty, they tried to figure out a carceral system that would compel the people living in it to seek death. And the people they wanted to die were the, um, the Butterhoff-Meinhof gang, who did, most of them die. Um, and this has been imported to the United States and used quite extensively. Um, in uh, the people who are sentenced to this prison within a prison in the California state system, are all accused, with very few exceptions, of being members of prison gangs. And the prison gangs in the California Department of Corrections are organized ag according to ascriptive categories, which are also have also over time become assertive categories, race and region, race, ethnicity, and region. The Department of Corrections <coughs> decided to, to organize the prisons in this way, in the wake of very radical prisoner organizing and uprising in the 1970s. This was the way they put the kibosh on that um, uh, uh, interracial, interethnic prisoner solidarity. So, so those are the people who are there. So the Aryan Brotherhood, white supremacists. Black guerrilla family, they are black. Uh, Northern Mexicans, Southern Mexicans, or a couple other groups. Uh, in uh, a few years ago, the, the people who live in this prison, who are in cells 23 hours a day and get to walk in what's like a dog run uh, for one hour a day maximum, who can't see each other uh, from cell to cell but can hear each other and have spent years, some of them have been there since the prison opened in 1989, have spent years talking and debating. 
decided to start a hunger strike to uh, demand basic uh, improvements to the situation in which they were. They wanted to have decent food. They wanted to have a way to get out of the prison within the prison. They're not getting out of prison, most of them, ever, because they have life sentences. But they wanted to be able to get out of the prison within the prison back to the general population. They wanted to be able to visit with their families and touch them, because they can, if they have visits, which is very rare, it's, between, it's across bulletproof glass. So these, and, and be able to send a photograph of themselves to their families who can't visit. These were their demands. Radical, yeah? <laughs> so, they went on a hunger strike because they understood um, uh, that the only violence that they could use would be the violence against their own bodies. Uh, the instrument of torture became the instrument of violent protest. So the demands were, as I said, quite modest, and they were directed upward. The prison service agreed to negotiate after a prisoner in another prison who had joined the uh, hunger strike in solidarity, indeed 30,000 prisoners throughout the system, joined the hunger strike. Um, uh, after a prison, prisoner in another prison died, the department said, we will negotiate. And the hunger strike was called off, and the prisoners waited and waited. And basically, what the department said was, well, we'll form a commission to study the problem. Um, but we're not going to exceed, uh, uh, concede any of your demands. So after some time, the prisoners started another strike. Um, but the second time, instead of sending their demands up to the administration, sort of within the realm of politicality in which they were ensnared, in which they could not even really hope to tweak, they sent their demands outward to their communities, both inside the prison, prisons and in the free world. The holes through which time is extracted from the place or scale of the territorialized body specifically and viscerally change, changes lives elf, elsewhere as well. Partners, children, communities, consciousness, the possibility of freedom itself. At the same time, the particular also implies entire historical geographies in the process of fundamental fragmentation and reconfiguration. So these prisoners, pierced by one conviction, the conviction that was sending them to prison for life, through which their lifetime is extracted, made where they are without changing that place, the structure of it, an abolitionist geography, through development of a negating conviction, brought about in a as a shift in consciousness, without a prior change in experience, which then changed their experience. And in a sense, this consciousness in, as, and of the suffering body, revalued through what Cedric Robinson calls the principle of incompleteness, each of us in the cage is incomplete without solidarity with the one in the next cage, <coughs> included, and I believe continues to include for the people in this prison who continue to fight on their own behalf, <coughs> included a sense of the incompleteness of our skin. Our skin, our largest organ, vulnerable to every ambient toxin, and all we have to hold us together, however much it seems to hold us apart. Thank you. <laughs>